Welcome to Rewind to Dynamite. It's John Pollock here along with Wei Ting here on this Wednesday night. Hello, Wei. Hey, how you doing, John? I'm doing I'm doing spectacular. For real? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Wonderful, wonderful day. Wonderful evening. And now I get to chat with you. Do I have anything to complain about? Um probably, but um, it, you know what? Better, better that we, uh, look at the positives in life. Oh, I have lots of positives, uh, to talk about tonight. So, okay. Sit, sit back and get ready. Uh, how is everything? Anything, uh, notable in the last 48 hours that I need to be updated on? No, no. I would say, uh, nothing. The excitement Not a in thing. My, yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of through with excitement in my life. Uh, looking to tone things down a little. So not nothing at all. What about you? Uh, did you realize that you and I are going to be spending Valentine's Day together? Um, kind of, yeah, because that's that's SmackDown, yes. So, I mean, evening. We'll be spending the evening together, but you know, Th- that that's even better. Friday night, Valentine's Day, you and I, and all of our uh, patrons, of course, <laughs> from the post wrestling cafe. Of course, cafe. I can't. Yeah. I can't wait. Well, so. you know, I will say if you wanted to take the night off um, to like if you wanted to delay the recording, I, I think we'd be OK. But I, I don't necessarily have any plans for the evening. So, well, I'll I'll, I'll be in touch with you. We're going to do the show on Friday night uh, to be determined what to, what time we record at. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a busy night for couples in general. I mean, not just uh, the greater large, but we have uh, Otis and, and Mandy Rose. That's how I Friday. know, actually. Yeah. That's, that's how I know it's Valentine's Day. Yeah. it's. Uh, I think there's high expectations by building that up for two weeks. They got to have some dynamite segments on Friday for this thing. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's actually been one of the positives of SmackDown as of late. So it's something I, I'm looking forward to. Well, you know what I'm looking forward to? What's that? Giving something away. Oh, that's right. Oh, man. Well... Since you're looking forward to it so much, maybe you might even have the list in front of you. Uh, do you think <laughs> I would I would be unprepared like that? Do you think that I would like come up with our giveaway segment, just throwing it at you like that, and I would not even have the list in front of me? Do you think that that's how I would operate, that I would just kill time as I tried to load up the list of all the potential cafe members, that being all of you, all cafe members are eligible every Wednesday night. And I would not forget to have the list right in front of me. So if you want me to pick a name way, I can pick a name. Just, just let me go. Wow. Just like that instantaneous, you've been ready. Well, before we do that, I I do want to remind everybody every single week on this show, we will give out one item from the post wrestling store, store store.postwrestling.com where you can find all of our merchandise. But this draw is open to anybody who is a patron of ours at Patreon, patreon.com slash post wrestling. Not only do you get uh, rewind a SmackDown exclusively on Fridays. You also get rewind away bi-weekly. You get our Marvel cinematic universe reviews monthly, and you can listen to our, uh, Black Panther review with me and Nate. That's just, that was just released yesterday. Uh, you can listen to ask away. You can listen to our new Japan pro wrestling reviews and you get live stream access to the cafe hangout as well as, uh, uh, a chance to leave feedback and all this other stuff. But, um, Post patreon.com slash post wrestling, but most importantly, yes. Let's let's name one lucky winner for the t shirt draw this week. That lucky member of the post wrestling cafe that is walking away with an item from the post wrestling store. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together because the winner is Paul Delo Santos. Ooh. All right. Congratulations, Paul. Almost from- almost uh almost a day winner here, so it's it's all paid off for him. He's got, he's got this item, Paul De Los Santos. You are the winner this week. Congratulations. Well, that's wonderful. Congratulations, Paul. I'll be in touch with you. Yes. And while we're at it, I will mention that 
Of course, we we do Rewind Away. It's a biweekly show at the Post Wrestling Cafe, uh, and you can be an espresso executive producer to choose what show we are going to review. Uh, we have 40 slots, and currently we have 39 people. So if you are listening out there and you have wanted to take the the deep dive, uh, there is a spot open. So I want to pass all, along to everybody. So let us move on now to some news items from today and, and chat about uh, what is going on in the world of pro wrestling. And we start off way, uh, with some ratings news. Uh, Monday night. Raw was uh, back up. They were up 8% this week, doing uh, just over 2.3 million viewers. Uh, Their main demo was up 19%, so that's always good news. It was back in line to what Raw is typically doing most weeks. Uh, But the interesting uh, uh, pattern this week was that the second hour was slightly ahead of the first hour, which typically we see in the summer, but not so much this time of the year. And... uh, this time of the year, that's an anomaly. So I don't know what it was about the second hour that uh, we had a slight increase over the first hour, but definitely a break from the norm. What was in the second hour? Uh, it wasn't the... Uh, the Here, let me look. I, I think like... Was it uh, Becky and Asuka was... That was the in the first. Hour. Yep, that was all and in the then, first. I mean, I mean, it, it could have been a have case been the, of... It must have been the fake blood. It you know you joke about that, but the fact of like doing a big angle and Shayna showing up, there might have been some people that tuned in over that. Um, I I don't know. I don't really have like a solid theory on uh, why the second hour did as well as it did, but uh, nonetheless, it was uh, it was up. Uh, some other uh, interesting notes are, are the fact last week they were going against the uh, the Iowa caucus results and all of that insanity, so they were kind of down last week, and you would think that would have affected their older audience a bit more last week. But this week, their their, old, their older audience was the exact same. It was more so uh, the younger audience that uh, propped the number up this week. So it was it was a good sign for Raw, you know, in the 2.3 million range, which I think is kind of what you're anticipating for an episode of Raw these days. So that was Monday night's uh, number. Uh, some other notes. Uh, I was just looking at now that all the numbers are in for the XFL this weekend – I think it was a really strong start for the XFL. When you look at uh, what they did, like demo wise, they were Sunday's game at five o'clock was number one on cable. Uh, The afternoon game on Fox beat everything else on network programming except for the Oscars. And then Saturday's game uh, on ABC and Fox, uh, the only thing it trailed in the in the main demo was Saturday Night Live. So uh, do you see this? holding up week two, or do you think it's going to be a dramatic drop-off this weekend? I've heard nothing but, like, praise, actually, and positive Mm -hmm. buzz coming off of this. So, if anything, I feel like it would do better, you know? At the very least, it seems like people aren't turned off by anything, Um, and and, in the best case, I think people were really entertained. So, I I think my my hopes are more optimistic for this. It's... I don't know if it'll do as well week one. Like, I think it will be down, but I'm kind of optimistic that it's not going to be down as much as maybe people think. Like, I don't think this thing is going to fall off a cliff. If it does, it'll be unfortunate. But it seemed the combination that the football was, like, pretty well received. Like, the the quality of play seemed to be uh, a strength, not a weakness. And there, and I also like the idea that it is four games. I think that that, not to say that that was different than, you know, the AAF last year, but... I think just having four games to promote, and I think that there is an appetite for this. So in the way that it's being presented, it's not like this this sideshow attraction. It's being presented as kind of just your natural extension that the NFL's gone, and here's like a perfectly fine substitute. So yeah, th- this week will obviously be the uh, the big weekend to look at and see what kind of retention you have. But um, those numbers were great, I think, this past weekend for week one for what you could reasonably expect in this in this day and age to to do sports wise, uh, how, how, how I feel is that like I think to me, when I hear the, the the letters XFL, I still think of it as a bit of a joke, and to hear that it's not that at least in the first week, it's not being presented at, as that at all. It if I was a football fan, I think I'd be a lot more um, willing to just take it seriously after like a week of good buzz. I think that the strategy has been a sound one. Vince McMahon is like so far removed from the presentation of this. And even when we were discussing, you know, 
Vince McMahon's going to be so ma- pulled in so many different directions here. Like one week in, it does not feel like Vince McMahon is changing up like what's going on here. It seems like he's pretty much a hands-off owner of this league. Hmm. Right. Yeah. I so, mean, do, do we, I mean, we don't exactly know perhaps behind, you know, closed doors, how much he's involved with, but at least in, 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 ter- in terms of the on-screen presentation. No. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's definitely not the face of this league. Like mm-hmm. many probably thought he would have been two years ago and certainly a drastic difference from uh, the original XFL. And I think they realized that, you know, Vince McMahon, he's he's funding this thing. He does have a certain level of, you know, fame that comes with this thing. But I think they realized the downfall of the XFL was also too much of Vince McMahon and his ideas as well. So they've kind of divorced themselves from that. And I, I think that this is a this to me has more of a success in the long run than, you know, doing something that you would have expected out of the Vince McMahon playbook. Yeah, we shall see. Um, we'll chat a bit more about this with uh, Marcus Vanderberg on the Cafe Hangout on Thursday. He's going to be joining us uh, from Yahoo Sports to chat about uh, the XFL. He, he can break down football a lot better than us. Uh, then we've got a WWE backstage from Tuesday night. They were uh, way up. They did 169,000 viewers. This was with CM Punk and Charlotte Flair was on the show. And after all those years of the Westminster Dog Show uh, preempting Raw It was actually one of the reasons that they cited when they left the USA Network for TNN back in 2000 that they got that TNN promised to never preempt them. Uh, And here they are all these years later. The Westminster Dog Show aired on FS1 Tuesday night as a lead in for backstage and led to back backstage starting 15 minutes late, but got this unbelievable lead in. Because the dog show did over a million viewers and likely contributed to backstage doing uh, their second best number. So look at this. All these years later, the Westminster Dog Show helping out WWE. It's, it's, a, it's an associate. It's, you know, it's the real uh, promotional wars. You know, forget WWE, WCW. I think it's pro wrestling and the, 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 the Westminster Dog Show. It'll never end. And the the final ratings note, uh, the UFC prelims from the weekend, they did 1,491,000 viewers. Uh, That's not at the level 246 uh, did last month for those prelims, but uh, that number was higher than all of the UFC's pay-per-view prelims last year. So uh, that would indicate, I think, strong interest in this pay-per-view. I wonder how much of a bump ESPN Plus received for this show uh, so close after that last Conor McGregor fight and... And what John Jones meant, because this was pretty much a John Jones built card going in. Um, but the prelim numbers at least suggest that there was a uh, high interest in this card on Saturday night. And even more coming out of it, I think, like tons of debate about this decision and so much about the judging. Mm-hmm. Uh, Triple H, Paul Levesque held a conference call on Wednesday to promote this coming weekend's uh, takeover show. And uh, we've got notes here, courtesy of... Uh, Andrew Thompson up on postwrestling.com and some of the items brought up uh, include, we won't go through all of them here, but he was asked about uh, AEW beating them in the key demo. And Paul Levesque brought up the long game and stated that he's happy with the product NXT is presenting right now. So um, I I have not heard the call, but it sounds like the way the question came, I think it was from Jason Powell was he specifically said, if you could go beyond, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Could you give us some, some more detail than just your uh, stock answer there? So that was kind of funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, And, and kind of gave an answer that kind of resembles that by saying it's about the long game. Yeah, yeah. I'm also really not sure what, what type of answer to expect otherwise. You know, he's not going to say, man, it, it's really embarrassing. And I don't really think he is. I think he truly believes in... Same with what Vince said last week on the investors call that, I mean, all things considered, they 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 at least seem happy enough with, you know, NXT's first year. Would you look at this overall, though, when you break this down, that it's it's the older audience that's really lifting this show up? Like, mm-hmm. this is a brand that was targeted towards your younger audience that another company is capturing at a, at a higher degree. I mean, do you look at that as... Uh, cause for concern? Do you look at that as something that uh, NXT, are they doing something wrong? Do, do how, how do you assess that, that this is attracting an older audience? Yeah, I, I really don't think like the problem is is necessarily with the product. 
you know, like I'm a fan of, of both shows. I like NXT a lot. And I, I feel like totally it, it, I can't really tell you like why it's not necessarily hitting other than the fact that I think AEW is really good. It's a lot more fresh. And if AEW wasn't around as competition, I think, I think NXT would be doing way, you know, way better amongst the, the prime demo. So if, if only really for it, it's perhaps it's, you know, their decision to like uh, go head to head with, with AEW, that might be the cause for this. And maybe that's part of like, you know, um, maybe overall they're like happy that, they can at least take a certain chunk out of AEW. I'm not sure, but either way, you're not going to get much more of an answer from either Vince or Hunter uh, admitting any sort of like real issues or problems that they might have. When I think when you look at the on-screen product, they, to me at least, it, there doesn't seem to be too many. If you if you were not doing this show, I think I know what your answer would be about which show you would watch over the other. But let me throw out this curveball at you, okay? On a Wednesday night, you don't have to do this show. You're just watching for leisure. It's Two hours of dynamite versus a one hour NXT on the USA network. What would be mm. more more enticing to you to watch live? I think in either case I would flip, like depending on what the better match was, the better segment was. Inevitably I think I would stick with like, you know, the cast of characters that I would enjoy the most. But like, um, if a main event on NXT was more important than, you know, what I perceived to be uh less important on, on AEW, for instance, I would probably watch NXT and vice versa. So, um, I'd be, I'd be somebody who would try to like try to keep tabs on both, but like just watching the shows consistently, uh, I would definitely say, I think AEW has been really strong this year at the end of last year. I would actually say NXT was the stronger show, but this year, um, AEW's just been on a, on a great run. Yeah. Um, he went on, he, uh, uh, were some other notes here kind of was a non-committal about, Um, The NXT title being defended at WrestleMania, saying that the TakeOver card that weekend is going to be epic and spoke about how difficult it is to fit everyone onto the WrestleMania card. Um, They talked a bit about uh, Simone Johnson and the pressure on her. Um, He confirmed exactly what you and I kind of uh, concluded here, and I I think most people did, about no halftime heat this year when Fox was the one uh, holding the Super Bowl. He said he was not sure if Shayna Baszler is on Raw or NXT full time. I have a hard time believing he does not know, uh, but hopes that what Shane and Becky do is uh, is massive. Um, talked about the signings of Killer Cross and Timothy Thatcher. Said that there would be uh, a commitment at Full Sail University that NXT, uh, they're going to have an announcement about NXT TV soon uh, because Full Sail has a commitment for one week. So not uh, – going any deeper than that and said he did not hear anything from Vince McMahon about the alleged uh, Matt Riddle Brock Lesnar confrontation he says he's read stuff and isn't sure if it's a work or not though again okay. I I don't think he would be um disclosing uh the answer to that as well so a lot of this is you know you kind of got to read between the lines and some of these answers and and whatnot but um yeah I, I wouldn't say this was a um a giant uh newsworthy uh conference call that Hunter had right right yeah Nothing, nothing too stunning. Um, what else do we have here? Um, on backstage as well, just uh, circling back to that, they announced that uh, John Cena will be appearing on the February 28th edition of SmackDown uh, from Boston, Massachusetts. This will be the day after Super Showdown. And I guess it kind of, um, you almost read this as like, this is an insurance policy that just in case anything goes wrong with uh, any talent getting back, um, you do have John Cena on this show on the Friday night. I didn't even think about it that way, but um, that 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 could be interesting. But surely, uh, you know, this would lead to uh, speculation that he might be a part of WrestleMania, perhaps even for a match, and not just a cameo appearance. What do you think? Um, there's certainly that natural speculation of what this is for. Now, he did mention he's he's promoting something um, while he's on SmackDown, but. Certainly, like this opens the door. If he was going to be doing something at WrestleMania, this would be the time to shoot that angle. Um, I I don't even know what his shooting schedule is like right now, if he's in the in the middle of anything or not. Um, I don't know. Do you do you is there that um, particular match that stands out? Do Do you see a role for John Cena in a in a wrestling capacity for this year's mania? I think if he's available, they would love to have him. Um, I think he think you compare him at this point he's been gone enough that i i feel like you compare him with most most mm, a lot of names on the roster and it would be some somewhat interesting um who, who, who on smackdown 
Right. On SmackDown itself, I mean, obviously, I think Roman is is a name, um, but he probably will be... Well, who will be feed. he linked to? Roman? Yeah. The Fiend. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I mean, unless they, they decide to go with, uh, like, Goldberg in this whole yeah. thing, which I just, I don't expect that to happen. I, I wouldn't completely rule it out, but, I mean, you're you're likely right. Um, if it's not Roman, if it's, you know, uh, could could be The Fiend, could be somebody else altogether that we're not even necessarily thinking about, could be Daniel Bryan. Um, like, your options on SmackDown would be Bryan, Corbin... Like they've done Corbin and Cena, I just I I have no interest in that. Elias, they kind of did that last year with the the rap battle deal. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Like I'm I, I'm not clamoring for Cena to do. Like I, I could be fine with Cena doing kind of like a walk on segment at WrestleMania, but um, it, it would all depend on what the idea is. If they had like a really hot angle to shoot on this show and and how it it came off. Um, I don't know if John Cena being on WrestleMania necessarily, um, it's going to change things. If it's just him wrestling a guy that's on the roster, you're not doing some big dream match or anything like that. I don't know how much yeah. of a difference it, it really makes. But nonetheless, this would be the time to do it if, in fact, they are uh, planning to have Cena involved at, at WrestleMania. I, I suppose the expectation for me is there because they're pre-announcing you know, this, this – um this this appearance on SmackDown, and what would he go on to SmackDown to say? You know, I guess he could announce himself as the host, um, something like that. But it would have to how, be some. How about just, how about we don't do a talking segment with John Cena with the Usos in the ring? Is that a good idea? I think so. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's, Considering let's, uh, let's he's in that. a Fast Fast and Furious movie coming. Oh out. Jesus! Yeah, don't uh, let's not do that one. Uh, so anyway, that's that's February twenty eighth. So smart on them to promote this uh, two weeks in advance. Like, oh, I think yeah. Cena's, Cena's one of those few guys that I think can make a, not a giant difference, but a difference uh, viewership-wise that week. We shall see. And last note here is that Ring of Honor, after uh, months of kind of their women's title being up in the air, they've announced uh, that it will be uh, a tournament that they're going to hold starting in April. They're going to be doing uh, eight opening round matches uh, coming up, I believe it's April 23rd in Philadelphia. So that means 16 women are going to be in this tournament. And uh, that suggests that they are going to have to go outside to bring women in. And this kind of is the succession of the women's title where kind of the lineage stopped when Kelly Klein was let go or contract was not renewed. Much like I think of many of their um, recent announcements. Uh, I mean, I really see this as a chance to rehabilitate the company and especially this particular division, which I think has been a sore spot for them uh, over the past year, blowing up, I think, uh, in a very public way and in a very embarrassing way with uh, all that stuff going on with Kelly Klein. So this is their chance to seemingly, you know, try to rid themselves of, of that whole thing, bring in fresh talent and show that this is not going to be a division that I think, you know, is 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 going to be dominated by headlines of like the allure and and, and things like that. Um, it's a chance for them to actually like showcase great women's wrestling, uh, which I don't think Ring of Honor has has necessarily developed a great reputation for over the past year. All right. Uh, you can catch up on all of the latest news going on in the industry up at postwrestling.com. Andrew Thompson has a, uh, a lengthy update up on the site as well as uh, stories coming out of tonight's show. So do go check all of that great stuff out. And we'll shift over now to AEW from Austin, Texas on Wednesday night. And uh, there was there was no time wasted on this show. Uh, they went right into our first of two title matches on the show, kicking things off. Kenny Omega, Hangman Page versus Frankie Kazarian and Scorpio Sky, a rematch for the tag titles. And Christopher Daniels was out in SCU's corner when a video ran of Dark Order wishing them luck and stating that they are watching and that there are more than four of us and some of us may be closer than you think. The Exalted One is coming and they cut to Christopher Daniels looking all panicked and he tells them he's going to go to the back to investigate. So... They're putting the spotlight on Christopher Daniels to kind of, I think this is just classic misdirection. Yes, yes, I think so. It'd be too obvious for it not to be. Probably end up being like, in these situations, it usually ends up being like somebody else, like Kaz or like, I don't know, something that would be crazy. But ho hopefully it makes a bit more sense than that. Um, but I would say like in previous weeks, they were 
they were they would also always mention the exalted one but it felt like to me in this particular segment they were really ramping up the actual reveal saying that you know members may be closer than you think we're waiting for the arrival of the exalted one so it does seem to be that it hints that a, a reveal will be imminent so the match begins uh, early on. SCU later to Kenny Omega gets stopped with Hangman's uh, Hangman stopping it. Then the Buckshot Lariat is stopped. Sky stops Kenny from diving to the floor by uh, pulling his leg. So Scorpio hits his own dive, followed by an Omega dive onto both members of SCU. Uh, Page and Omega are working together with the, uh, the You Can't Escape uh, combo here with uh, Page coming off the turnbuckle. But then they work on Omega and attack his back. And he had the the remnants of a... Suction cup therapy. So I wonder if his, uh, I- I'm sure his back is uh, giving this man problems. Or he's just going for that Yuji Nagata uh, G1 look. Um, apparently, I mean, it works. I've tried it myself uh, without um, any, honestly, any noticeable benefit. But um, evidently it works for plenty of people enough that they, they would do it repeatedly. Is it painful? No, not so much. I mean, it just kind of, it's almost just like, mm, it's just weird. It feels a bit weird and it looks worse than it actually feels. So, and did you, what were you, you just had like regular back pain and did did it just like eliminate? I didn't even uh, really like go because I had pain. Like it was just more so like a form of massage. I mean, that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. I've never had it. I'm curious. Moving your blood around. Well, um, the Buckshot Lariat misses Scorpio Sky, so Kazarian hits his own clothesline for a near fall on Page. We get a pair of cutters and dragon sleepers applied by SCU. Omega knocks Kazarian into Sky and Page, and then it's a Snapdragon on Sky. Uh, Omega gets free of Scorpio Sky, hits a V-Trigger from behind, and they do the Buckshot V-Trigger combo onto Kazarian and get the pinfall. 13 minutes, 15 seconds, as Page got his beer and left through the crowd, and Man, from the get-go, this crowd in Austin, Texas, man, were they amped to be here for this show because they were so loud during, uh, and this was the start of it. They were such an excellent audience in Austin. Um, They they made, I would say, every segment feel better. They made all the um, wrestlers feel like bigger stars. Um, A really great crowd here. And they definitely added to this particular match, uh, in particular for Adam Page, who continues to just be like a standout Seems seemingly, you know, at this point, the most popular member, at least between the Bucks and 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 Kenny Omega, it's it's Adam Page who is the hottest one right now. So that seemed to continue here. They just love that this 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 new character. Um, this match was a great sprint, great reactions to all of them, but in partic- particular, definitely Adam Page. And they continue to. They're not hitting you over the head with it, but much like when the title loss happened on the cruise, Kazarian was just. They just show him and Sky in the ring, and Kazarian's just looking frustrated and upset but they're not it's it, they're being subtle about it right yeah so i mean maybe it is Kaz in the dark order oh i don't know could be could be um the dark order come out and then the best friends run in followed by the butcher and the blade the hybrid two are in and then my god you would have thought that who's who's a relevant pop group that ran out. Uh, this BTS. was. Yes, exactly. Right. It, it was at the tip of my tongue. The young bucks run out and this place screams for the bucks as they run in. And it's just a preview for the battle Royal next week with all the tag teams going at it and uh, just establishing some of the teams that you'll see next week for the title shot. Yeah. I really just like any go home show to every Royal rumble, you know, it really, it just, Everybody's out there for practice, basically, trying to throw each other over the top rope. Now, during the break, we had the picture in picture, and Orange Cassidy comes out, and the Bucks super kick Dark Order on the ramp, and then Cassidy and the Bucks are in the ring together, and they give each other the weak super kicks together. I thought this was your perfect picture in picture kind of segment because it's very visual. There was so much during picture in picture this week that I wish I could have listen to because again this austin crowd made everything like sound great and you know when orange cassidy was in there they were losing their shit um it looked like it looks like a AEW's uh top selling item is an orange cassidy shirt this week so that guy is um 
without having wrestled a singles match, to my knowledge, on TV yet, he is definitely amongst their most popular guys. So I really wanted to hear the audience with this segment. But, you know, I guess you had to save something for picture in picture. And this was maybe, if anything, maybe a, a, a commercial for, for the Fight TV stream. I will say that I know that this year I can say, hey, we, we went to the Tokyo Dome. We went to Cork and Hall. We saw Jushin Liger's retirement live. But all those things are taking a silver medal to the live experience that will be Orange Cassidy, Minoru Suzuki this year. There is no, yeah. <laughs> there is no thing WrestleMania weekend I am more looking forward to than that fucking match. You think of a main event? Dude, it's my main event. I don't care if it's on 1st, 2nd, or 20th. I, yeah. There's nothing following that. I don't care what they've got at, at spring break. That thing is going to be amazing. I, Here's and, a, and, here, sorry, and go ahead. Just watching Minoru Suzuki this past weekend. Like That's all I could think about. Was I cannot wait to watch this man with Orange Cassidy. Because these guys are going to tear it down. I don't know what this match is going to look like, but I know it's going to be great. Well, it, it, it's that's what I think is most fascinating to me is I don't know what type of type of match they're going to wrestle. You know, obviously a lot of it will be based in comedy um, and, and just the contrast of I think styles. But how can these two create a good wrestling match, like a good technical wrestling match, or will they? Will that even be the point? We'll we'll see. I mean, it's um, I don't know what to expect, but I have high hopes. Um, then they are, are previewing the rest of the show. And they're pushing the fact that Nyla Rose has not been pinned since October the 2nd when she lost to Riho on the very first episode of Dynamite. And I think that should have been emphasized a lot more. Like, that's a great stat to kind of build this up. It is a good stat. I mean, it's a bit of, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's completely, like, honest because she was suspended in storyline for quite a bit of it. But um, I suppose amongst the roster, sure, it is something that they could have emphasized. I mean, it's true, though. It's like she she did lose in a four-way, but they did say, like, she has not been pinned since October It's true, 7. but she was also away for much of it. Okay. Well, it's uh, it's not to me deceptive. It's uh, how long was she gone? Four episodes? Wasn't she, like, suspended for more than that? Like, I thought it was a month that they suspended her. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. I forget. Then we go to earlier in the day, Jim Ross is doing a sit-down interview with Santana. And Jim Ross asks Santana to explain what he meant by being in the darkness. And he said that 10 years ago, he was at the deepest, darkest moment of his life. He was broke, and he felt that he was being buried alive day after day. And one time at his breaking point, he called up his father at 3.30 in the morning, and his father picked up, And he explained all of this and said that every day felt dark. And that's my life every single day. And how his father was told at the age of 14, he was losing his sight and would be blind by the age of 25. And here is Santana and this man going after his sight. Something that Santana has a personal, uh, has been personally affected by the loss of this particular sense. And his father was stolen from him, never got to say goodbye. And then Jim Ross says, you know, this attack by Moxley could be considered retaliatory. Do you not think it's Chris Jericho that you should be pissed off at? And Santana explains how Moxley was the one that screwed up by not joining the inner circle. And he's going to let John Moxley know what it's like to be in the dark. This was so great. This was amazing. It was excellent. I mean, holy Santana, Christ, Santana! This was like ex- the biggest baby face by the end of this man. Well, yeah, that's the thing. It, it wasn't exactly a heel segment, but I mean, I think the point is that is that it made you feel um, using something that obviously was very real to uh, Santana here. And by the way, that's what he was he was referring to uh, when when last week. I think a lot some of us were confused about what he meant by having what he said he was he was having the worst year of his life. He was talking about the death of his father. So um, 
obviously, I think relying on a whole lot of, you know, real life emotion in order to get a performance like this. And yeah, it wasn't exactly the type of segment that made you hate him. But you knew that this fe- this fight was going to be heated because this guy is sort of, uh, you know, um, m- mis- misinterpreting, I think, you know, something that um, uh, isn't necessarily targeted specifically towards him as something that is specifically targeted towards him. So, you know, the feud is going to be good. And this also sets up like down the road, there is the, you know, the eventual turn of whether it be Santana and Ortiz or just Santana. It's like you kind of leave it that he's under the he's under the illusion of Chris Jericho being like Mm -hmm. this this leader for him. And you can see like Jr. bringing up like the fact that, you know, the guy that you are trusting here is ultimately responsible for this because this was John Moxley in response to what Chris Jericho did. I thought Jr. was phenomenal here. Oh, he's been doing like all these Jr. sit downs have been excellent. Like, they are JR at his best, where, like, they get very serious. JR kind of has, like, such a great um, tone of voice where he's able to, like, just make things feel like like they're sports. You know, like, it's a real, like, 2020-style interview, no matter how ridiculous the character might be. JR just, like, does it very calmly, very quietly, and talking talking to these people like they're they're real human beings. And um, they, they always come across really well. This one, I think, one of the best that they've done. Excellent segment. We had another Darby Allen black and white video, but this time we don't even see Darby. Instead, he's just got like torn up pieces of cardboard he's written on that read, smashing my throat with a skateboard. You made a mistake. Sooner or later, I'll find you. But in the meantime, Sammy, you busy at Revolution? Hit me up. And we've got a photo of, or not a photo, but a drawing of, of Sammy Guevara with the caption, kissing Jericho's ass gave me herpes. <laughs> yes. So a take on, you know, the Sammy Guevara cue card, um, Bob Dylan thing. Yeah. Which I, it, all the while you can hear like, uh, what is it? Uh, Darby making these sort of like choking noises in the background because his throat's still fucked up. Um, I thought this was a really cool and original way to issue a challenge to a match. Um, uh, it combined both Darby Allen's videos along with, Sammy Guevara's, Guevara's uh, particular style of videos. And it made me realize like these two brand new talents have their own style of video segment now already. And this was, I think, a great combination of both of them. So uh, I liked it a lot. I thought this was re- really well thought out. I, lo- I liked the video last week and this was a follow up to it. Jim Ross added that Darby and his injury are worse than originally thought. So, I mean, this maybe this guy's going to be muted for a while. He's going to have to communicate in other ways. It's not such a bad thing. I mean, we've think- had eye injuries. We we got a throat injury now, so we just need like somebody's like sense of smell to go away. Do you think uh, Edge was going to make one of these videos for Randy Orton? Huh. Uh I don't know. Uh, pro- I uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Sammy Guevara was out with Jake Hager to take on Austin, Texas's own Dustin Rhodes, where he uh, resides now. And gone is Brain Stew. What? Are you sure? I'm pretty sure it was still there. I don't think this this was not the Brain Stew song you came out to. You sure about that? I didn't. It didn't sound like it. I think there was like a different intro to it, maybe, but it still oh. sounded the, the same to me. Okay. Well, I will have to double check. I, th- I thought he had gotten a a, re, a, a new song here. Um. Dustin gets into Jake Hager's face early on. This crowd is in love with Dustin Rhodes. Uh, They're just going nuts for him. He can do no wrong here. They're chanting, you still got it. And, you know, I'm thinking midway during this match that, well, I know where this is going. It's obvious that, you know, Guevara is getting ready for the Derby match. And I'm already thinking ahead that, you know, I really hope that if Dustin's going to lose here, they bring him back for like dark after the show. And he gets a win in front of this crowd because it's going to be so unfortunate that he's going to lose here. And much to my chagrin here, we have Sammy Guevara with his knee. Uh, Dustin kicks out and then Sammy gets dropped off of the turnbuckle. Canadian destroyer and Dustin hits the final reckoning and pins Sammy Guevara. And this place just explodes. I was really surprised um, because Sammy is the one who 
just had a challenge issue to him in the segment prior from Darby Allen. He's the guy who is supposedly in a more high profile program at the pay per view, but um, I guess that was before Dustin here issued a challenge. I mean, you know, you could definitely argue whether or not Guevara should have been placed in this role at all. I don't personally love it. Um, at the same time, like, you know, it, like it could have been somebody like Ortiz, for instance. But at the same time, I, I think they are trying to show that you can't protect everybody. Everybody eventually is going to have a match on the pay-per-view. And does that mean nobody can lose in that time? Um, by the end of it, I didn't think it was such a bad thing. I, di- I didn't think it was at all because I think that Guevara and Allen, they have like a personal issue with the two of them um, that – I think it's fine. And the fact that you are going to Dustin and, and Hager, like to announce this at the pay-per-view, I mean, this gives some momentum for Dustin Rhodes that it doesn't feel like it's just this um, outcome you immediately dismiss as Dustin having uh, just losing to this guy. I think that you, you gave him this win, so there's actually some spark to this match. And Dustin cut this great promo afterward. He called Jake Hager Chris Jericho's bitch, so the crowd started chanting it, and he asks if he's going to step into the ring or just take a paycheck. You've been failing at your MMA career. You're failing here. And you broke my arm, and I want you at Revolution. And he tells him to walk down the aisle, look him in the eye, and accept the match. And this crowd's just going to, into a frenzy. And then JR has to get in there and correct him, saying, Jake Hager's MMA career is not failing. He's undefeated. But it did sound good from Dustin, and the crowd loved it. And, it was, yeah. and set up the pay-per-view. Line. Very hot line, very hot line. And um, I think throughout the match, I was actually still really surprised that, like, Dustin Rhodes is nearly double Sammy Guevara's age. And I really do think it's incredible how he's able to keep up at this pace, looking like the best he's honestly ever looked, in my opinion. So I'm I'm really excited to see him, like, have a big pay-per-view match. Then they recapped Britt Baker's Dental disaster. And they note that Yuka Sakazaki fractured her molar. And when asking Britt backstage what Sakazaki is facing recovery wise, she told them months of oral surgery. So Tony Schiavone is out there and he brings out Britt Baker for the greatest segment in history. She justifies what she did last week by staying true to her ethical and legal duty in her oath to the public. She said that tooth, number 19, mandibular second molar of Sakazaki's had extensive decay. It led to severe palpinorcrosis and the formation of a chronic palpable abscess. That tooth was going to come out anyway. It needed to come out. I did her a favor. I did it for free. And we can all assume that Sakazaki did not have health insurance. Although, Tony, you do, Mr. Starbucks. She then proceeded to call the crowd and looking at a bunch of chubby Whataburger faces, which just outraged this crowd and led to a Whataburger chant. And if this lands them a sponsor, this segment could draw more money than most segments in the history of wrestling. She says she's a role. I mean, yeah. I mean, she's going for the high-end brands here. She's a role model. She has three degrees. She was the first woman signed to AEW. This is her division. Dude, this woman is phenomenal. Um, At the end of this, I was ready to say that this promo was a 10 out of 10. Um... I'm only going to downgrade it to a 9.5 out of 10. And I only say that because I was contacted by listener Dr. J, who's a practicing dentist, who informed me that mandibular second molar is number 18 and not 19. And I did say I would correct the record for the dental listeners out there. Oh, wow. But I mean, other than that, I mean, this was this was a grand slam. I thought Britt Baker was so awesome here. I loved this segment. I rewatched it. It was so good. I had to rewatch it multiple times to get all the the uh, the wording, which I probably screwed up. But nonetheless, this was I love this. I love this segment so much. It was great. It was great. Um, I thought at this point, 
maybe even throughout the entire show, the most heat of the entire show was Britt Baker here. They hated she, her. They hated her. I mean, you know, um, I guess you you can insult Whataburger in Texas. It's it's a very personal thing. From uh, this was also a great commercial for Whataburger. I didn't even know it was like a real like Texas thing. So next time I'm in Texas, I I will definitely make an effort to do that. Um, I I think she not only this could have been really bad, honestly. Like going so deep into the dentist thing. Oh, I, I thought she, it was really clever. I really thought it was mm, funny. I I think it could have been like really comical. Like almost too much, like you know Isaac Yankum DDS like, but I think she had a really difficult line to straddle between like um, saying these words, but also making it very obvious that she was being sarcastic as a way to you know not take responsibility for actually harming uh, Yuka Sakazaki maliciously, um, and I thought she straddled that line perfectly. Uh, she reacted to. Um, the the audiences uh, chant incredibly, even threw up like the Texas horns and then flipped them down at the end, which just yeah, ju- yeah. kept escalating that heat even more. So not only I think is, you know, the character really working out for her. I think she's really shown that she has like such a great aptitude for this type of role. She was just phenomenal here. I mean, what a what a turnaround just as a personality. I mean, this has been remarkable. Um, what like in a month. I mean, she she's probably ha- had it within her like for quite a while, and maybe it just shows you that you know some people are just way better as heels. Well, she's she's been fantastic. I thought I thought this was great. Rio and Nyla Rose are rematch for the AEW Women's Title, and Rio just storms her at the beginning, and Rose uh, ends up catching her off this high cross to the floor and drives her into the apron and pulls out a table. And as she's pulling it out and setting the table up, Rio drills her with a missile drop kick off the apron. We come back from the break. Rio hit a crucifix bomb. And then Rio uh, ends up getting attacked by Rose, draped on the top rope, and hit with a flying knee. And Rio kicks out, and this crowd roars. And at this point, this crowd was so behind Rio. And this has been like a trend of her matches where the people just get into this woman fighting from underneath, and it was, to me, the uh, the best example in this match. Rose bit her in the face, hit a DVD off the top for a near fall. Crowd's going insane here, chanting for Riho. Then Nyla Rose lifts her for a one-winged angel, and Riho stops it, and then hits Rose with two Snapdragon suplexes. She then goes for the running V-trigger into the corner, misses, then avoids the stretch muffler. There's a bridging northern lights. And then Riho powers up and hits multiple double foot stomps. And Rose uh, kicks out at the count of... After the first double foot stomp, she kicked out at one and then proceeded to hit two more. Rose comes back from the dead, hits a spear and a sit-out power bomb, and wins the title from Riho. Um, th- this crowd, to me, was like... They were the stars of this thing. Um, it was really tough because, like... A couple minutes into this match, I would say midway through this match, to me it felt like they're totally on board with Riho here, and I think like she's really gaining like this traction now. Um, that was a little surprised by the outcome here, but it seems like they are certainly teasing something between Nyla Rose and and Kenny Omega, both with the one winged angel tease and then our I would say frustrating picture in picture segment that followed this. Yeah, this was the most frustrating when like they basically played out an entire like backstage talking segment, but in picture in picture, so you couldn't hear it. Um, well, I mean, if there's any perhaps uh, more speculation about their them possibly doing mixed tag, I I feel like something like that. Uh, Riho teaming with Kenny against Nyla and somebody else would be a, a good way of introducing it to a to a wider audience. So that could be possible. Um, but the, as for the match itself, I thought it was really great. You know. Um, I think, especially when you compare it to their first encounter, you can really see how far both women have come in terms of recognition with this crowd and how much the crowd either really likes or really hates them uh, after, you know, pretty much like at this point, what is it? October, like, I don't know, nearly half a year of, of TV introduction and TV time. This was an, an audience that was entirely with both characters, I would say, throughout the, the match. And I think Nyla has gotten so much better in that time. I think Rio has gotten far more comfortable in this sort of live TV American wrestling setting. Um, she came across just like as a, the ultimate underdog babyface. I really like seeing some of those spots in particular of her 
suplexing an Isle of Rose around. Like, I know it's not that realistic, but it looks awesome, so I don't give a shit. I can I can watch not, uh, Riho suplex an Isle of Rose all day long. I'm fine with the title change. I think the division at this point needs some freshening up. Like, Riho's beaten pretty much uh, almost everybody. Not everybody, but almost everybody. I think you have somebody like Chris Statlander waiting in the wings to challenge somebody like... Uh, a, a, a legitimate heel in Nyla Rose that I think could be really good. Uh, Hikaru Shida, you know, gives her a big match against Nyla Rose coming up as well. Riho, I feel like she was doing really well, and I think you've achieved plenty with her. Now let's reset her, get her chasing for the belt, continue to build her that way, while I think everybody else has somebody big, bigger to chase. Uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. It just felt like, man, it was just to me, everything had come together with, with Riho over the last little while. And this match to me just kind of crystallized that. But, um, but taking the belt off of her doesn't necessarily mean her push is over. No, no, it, no, it it doesn't at all. We'll, we'll see. It can I, I'm, be a bigger push for her if they tell the right story. Yeah, I wasn't so much the, the, the title change. It's more so what they what do they have planned with Nyla Rose? Because I, I'm not as uh, I, I don't think she has improved to, to the degree that. I would base the whole division around her, but um, clearly they're they're te- they're teasing this direction that if um, that that they want to go this route with with Kenny Omega, obviously. Well, I think simply as an archetype, like she, she you could do a lot more with her than I think with somebody like Riho. As as far as you know, getting the rest of the division to chase after her, like she's just simply like you know the, a large competitor in, in the division that would look great in matches stacked up against Chris Statlander or Nyla Rose or sorry, or uh, Hikaru Shida or any number of your, your baby faces. I yeah. also feel like AEW will probably do a lot more with Nyla Rose as a, as a character on TV, given that um, they'll probably have her do more speaking roles than they ever did with Riho. I think we could say by this point, um, I feel like I've only heard Riho speak what, like twice in those subtitle segments. So they never really figured out how to use her effectively in a, in a personality. I think, um, I don't know. Uh, showcase effect on TV at this point, uh, which is disappointing to me. But again, like the fact that she doesn't have the belt doesn't mean her push is over. Maybe this will allow her to be able to tell more stories in a, in a different way, give her something to fight for. So during the picture in picture, Rose goes backstage and she's holding the title up right in front of Kenny Omega and they're exchanging words. And I just hope that this segment is either put up on YouTube or airs on dark or just something. Uh, I can't imagine like you would do this segment uh, with no plan to, to run it. So I'm sure this has to pop up somewhere because it was just frustrating to see them talking uh, during this segment. And you naturally want to hear this. Yeah. Yeah. It was frustrating. Um, I, I wonder if like what they, how they explained it. I mean, I'm sure there are people that, that watched it and please uh, let us know if you saw it on fight T or, or whatever, and you got to see all the dialogue, but were they acknowledging Kenny as the person in charge of the women's division or, or was Kenny simply there because he is the, you know, the friend of, of, uh, of Riho. Lexi is with the inner circle and Jericho runs down John Moxley. And he said that tonight he's facing Santana but he has scoured the globe for an assassin to tear John Moxley apart limb from limb. So if he survives Santana next week, he's going to face a man that toured the world, ending people's careers. You are going to face Jeff Cobb. Yeah. Um, a signing that, uh, as far as I know, wasn't necessarily talked about anywhere. And this, at least to me, was the first reveal of it. So, a big surprise that they could have like just I guess waited for his appearance at the end of the show, but I I I don't mind them just like having Jericho announce it here because I think as much as maybe you and I might know Jeff Cobb, maybe the listeners of this show might know Jeff Cobb, he's still not necessarily like a TNT audience recognized person. So for a lot of people, they're seeing Jeff Cobb for the very first time here. They've never heard of him, so I think having Jericho introduce him this way, making him look really cool in a video afterwards. Maybe the right call. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with it. That um, you, you would be talking about a lot of people that might not know who who this guy is. So having this video package, and it was still a surprise when he showed up at the end because I don't think anyone was expecting him to be here tonight. Yeah, I certainly didn't. Um, what do you think of him? How do you think you know the fact that he he chose to sign with AEW when he likely could have stayed with ROH, could have probably joined NXT? Uh, well, I was think- I was. 
surprised because I just assumed like he he was one with, with like Ring of Honor that it just seemed like it would make the most sense. Like he works there and and goes to New Japan back and forth. Um, now there's there's nothing that says he doesn't have a deal that he can still do New Japan during all of this. But you would think that this is you know this is committing to AEW that it's going to probably you know if you're New Japan um, do. Do you want to necessarily do, – do you have the same interest in a Jeff Cobb if you know that you know it's going to be limited when you can use him? Do you want to fill your roster with AEW talent, basically? If you're Yeah, that, that you can't use in a big part of the world. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I also don't know if like Jeff Cobb necessarily has the same amount of clout that like a Je- Chris Jericho or a John Moxley might have in order to demand something like that. Um my feeling is no, but again, we shall see. You know, I I think he's a great addition to AEW. Clearly, I I believe he would have done really well in NXT as well. But I think in NXT and in the WWE, he'd be occupying a space that that is sort of already taken up by guys like Keith Lee, you know, Die Jack, and even on the main roster, somebody like Samoa Joe. And who knows he even when he would even get a proper push even in NXT, much less the main roster. Whereas in AEW, I think already we see him being slotted at the very top very quickly. There's really nobody else that is sort of like the big man who moves like he him uh, thus far in the singles division, at least in AEW. So I think it's it's a it's the best choice for him. God, he could have gone to he could have gone to WWE, put him on SmackDown, and he could have saved uh, Gable's career. And they could have just been the Olympians. Oh God! So you have Shorty G and um, big, big heavy C. heavy C. Heavy C. <laughs> I mean, those two would be a phenomenal tag team together. Of course they would, dude. Like, Chad Gable with anybody would be a great tag team, but yeah. he, his name is Shorty G, man. Um, do, you, do you like the idea of putting him in the inner circle? Like, I like this introduction, but it, it really feels like he almost replaces Jake Hager's role. Well, the way they framed it was that, like, Jericho hired a hitman, similar to, I guess, how Cody hired, you know, the Butcher and the Blade. So I don't know if this is more of a one-time thing or of a per- permanent thing. Um, I think he fits in as long as they maybe take Hager in a slightly different direction. You're right. Like Hager at this point has kind of been presented as like the sli- silent, but deadly heavy. But, um, this is Jeff the undefeated Mobbit. MMA fighter. Like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you stick him on Moxley rather than have to do all this uh, scouring of the world? I guess he's busy too. Right. But yeah, sure. Yeah. You would think so. But I also got the sense that Hager is kind of like maybe more, um, playing comedy now like turning his character into a bit more of a comedic big guy, big, quiet, funny guy. Well, you notice tonight they pointed it out when he got outraged. He was like freaking out over one of the near falls with Guevara and the announcers even called attention. Like this is the most animated we've seen Jake Hager. So it almost looks like they're taking the, uh, the guy with no emotion and kind of putting that onto Jeff Cobb, who is now the the no nonsense guy. That's just going to be your monster that doesn't talk. Yeah, that's right. At the at the very last segment, I mean, Hager was like, you know, mugging for the cameras mockingly, which is yeah. not something I think he would have done first week into the inner circle. Um, so, yeah, maybe it's a change of direction for Hager. They recapped Cody taking the lashes last week. He was not on the show tonight. Brandy Rhodes was. She was on commentary right back to the babyface role and apologizes to Excalibur uh, for past comments she made. And and that was it. This was our 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 dynamite uh, official ending of the old character. I wish they would have like shown some of those videos on the show. I mean, I guess there's no real time. to. I, I don't think they even want to like waste time on it. I think for the people that want that closure to the angle we gave it to them online but for the body of the show like why even draw attention to something that we are not even focusing on anymore i suppose so it, it's just confusing you know for people who never saw those videos for people who didn't listen to her interview on wrestling observer live it's just all of a sudden this like person who's been cutting hair is now a good guy again so yeah whatever that's the power of those lashings i guess so MJF and Jungle Boy, um, these two had a match on the cruise, and I've got to imagine it went off really well, the fact that they went ahead and did this on TV uh, this week. But um, they start off, um, MJF did the strut at one point, and then offers his hand to Jungle Boy, who spits in his own hand and shakes MJF's hand. And uh, this crowd is just loving Jungle Boy. 
Arn was watching backstage. Um, we get a pair of dives as a uh, Jungle Boy hit uh, a number of dives, ending with the Topekan Hero. There was a Poison Rana. They mention that MJF has never been pinned or submitted in an AEW ring. So I always like when they throw in stuff like that. Like it means that much more for the guy that beats this guy when you're not just mentioning it like during the night of to uh, execute that. Like build it up for a while. So it means something. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. MJF. Lifts him onto his back for this submission. Then on the turnbuckle, he yells at Brandy about getting with a real man while he grabs his balls. And Jim Ross was so appalled by this. He was just disgusted. And Jungle Boy was able to hit a Liger bomb. MJF kicked out. Wardlow returns. He had left ringside. And he places the the the, the diamond ring onto MJF's finger. He clocks Jungle Boy removes the ring, there's tons of heat, and the double cross for the victory. And then Wardlow uh, spun uh, Jungle Boy off his shoulders. This was like an F-15, and Jurassic Express ran down to Hmm. help out Jungle Boy. I thought this was a really good match. Really great showcase for Jungle Boy, who, you know, has has made pretty intermittent appearances since uh, the big Jericho appearance, but... Uh, he made the most of it here. He looks so smooth, so spectacular. They had and good I chemistry. Think, yeah, definitely. So, uh, and and I think we we you know saw a lot more personality out, out of Jungle Bull. He isn't necessarily somebody who's just like you know like a uh, really great high flyer. Uh, I think especially against a personality like MJF, you can't help but have somebody like Jungle Boy, you know, showcase some of his personality as well. But on the other hand. I mean, MJF, somebody who I think we all know for his personality and his great ability on, on the mic, I thought he looked really good in ring here, too. And that's certainly a part of his game that I think has been pretty understated. But uh, the guy is actually very athletic, and he delivered, I thought, a great match here with Jungle Boy. So this it was also this crowd, too. This crowd was making everybody look great. This, is, this was an awesome crowd. And the announcers did a really great job putting over the fact that we've got uh, MJF, who's 23, Jungle Boy is 22, and these two could be main eventers here for years to come. And it's it's crazy when you look at the age of these two and potentially what is ahead of them in their careers. I can't believe that guy's that young. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. We got another <laughs> – this was awesome – another taped pack promo. He's in this dark alleyway in the dark uh, in his tights. <laughs> It's just this guy, like you could do a meme of just putting this guy shirtless into like uh, a tornado or in a, uh, there's a tsunami and he's just in, the man never needs a shirt. Um, in the Arctic. Yeah. I, yeah. I found it interesting though. He didn't start the video in his shirt. Like he was actually wearing like, you know, just like a, a sweat suit or something like that. And oh, that's right. And then in- we cut outside and it's, and then the shirt's gone. Well, like he was outside wearing wearing stuff, but then like when he gets into actual like you know heightened, angry promo bastard mode, that's when he appears in full gear. So he's he's he Hulk. Just, he's the Hulk. Yeah, all, clearly. Yeah. He says Omega is a shell of his former self, and he's heading towards mediocrity. And he's never been the same since Pac choked him out in Chicago. And he takes all the credit for Omega's problems. And, uh. And that was the promo. Just uh, we'll probably get another one of these next week leading into the Iron Man match in two weeks in Kansas City. These videos are really good. And I, I, I think I really have to applaud like I don't know who's responsible for shooting all of these because clearly it's not the same people. The people that are shooting Darby Allen's videos aren't going to be the same people that are shooting P- PAX videos in Newcastle. So I don't know if they're just like uh, t- giving these guys a budget and telling them to hire like video people and just to create the type of thing that you want to create, but they've all been excellent. Like we know Brandy paid for her own or at least hired her own people for, to make her videos. Those looked excellent. Um, So I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but there's been some direction that like has resulted in like some great video work, video packages from all the AEW talent thus far or in the new year. And and they've all been turning out really well. Um, I think all I'm missing from this feud is some reaction from Kenny. Like, Kenny is just, doesn't even seem like he's a part of this program right now. It's just kind of packed talking to himself. Um, Kenny seems just so busy with, like, whether it be uh, stuff with Riho or stuff with Paige or in the Bucks. Like, I need more response and more more selling, I think, of, like, these these great promos from, from Pac. 
or or is that kind of the the story here that he's got all these different directions and he's overlooking Pac and he's going to lose to this guy? Well, then at least show me that, right? I, I think they're like, kind of conveying that by like you know the promo a few weeks ago was like I'll get around to facing Pac and doing it. We'll do the rubber match. I'll I'll get to it. Like that's kind of been he's been dismissing this guy who is on the counter like obsessed with this Omega match. I suppose to me, there's a way of showing that too, whether it just be like, you know, this video playing in the background and Kenny's just like, um, not even watching it, that type of thing, just to draw the visual association in my head. Cause right now it just feels like it's packed shutting into like a black hole. Next week in Atlanta, we've got Cody and Wardlow in the cage match, uh, for the battle Royal. These are the tag teams announced. We have Santana and Ortiz, Shima and T-Hawk, John Silver and Alex Reynolds, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy, the Young Bucks, SCU, the Best Friends, Butcher and Blade, Private Party, and the Hybrid Two. And then the winners get the tag title shot at Revolution. Will it be anyone yeah. but the Young Bucks winning this? Could you see um, a surprise winner? Oh, man. Silver um, and Reynolds. Do you know, like, to suggest that it's that you do Bucks and Page and Omega, this might, this will probably be have to be the time, right? Because. You're not going to have something until May for like a big enough show to do that match. So um, probably the Bucks then. Sure. Yeah. There was probably 15 seconds as everyone was looking at this graphic that everyone was asking the same question. Why aren't Pentagon and Phoenix in this match? And that's because they're challenging Omega and Paige next week for the tag titles, which is Quite the match to just throw out on TV with, like, no notice. Well, I guess it's a week's notice, but no program or anything. But, I mean, this thing's going to be fantastic next week. I know. Well, could it be that um, maybe Omega and Pages run is not going to end or not going to last that long to do to do this again? Um, do you mean to lose the titles next week? I'm saying uh, if Paige and Omega are set to lose the belt uh, sometime in the near future, maybe they oh. need to kind of cash in on all these hot matches right now. They they could do that. Like maybe uh, Omega and Hangman losing them at the pay-per-view is the right time to do it. If you're uh, going to do the split or you have um, other directions and ideas for Kenny Omega at, at this point. So uh, possible. Yeah. So. Yeah. So maybe that's why they're doing it, doing it with such a little bit bill. Yeah. I think this is going to feel like a big show next week. This is one they've been building up for a while in Atlanta. And I think, uh, I, I think anytime Cody is promoted ahead of time for something big, I think those kind of become big shows. And this, this, this is going to be a big one next week in Atlanta. And he didn't appear on the show at all. No, no main event, John Moxley and Santana. Eye for an eye. Uh, the inner circle came out. They were in the private box. Um, way, give us your grade on the crowd singing. I uh, Austin, I definitely think get get a very good pass. I, I mean, if this was um, if if I think it, if this was like a small a crowd as small as the boat, I feel like it would have sounded even better. Better, but because it was like so dispersed, I mean, it sounded great. Everybody like they they paused, they cut the music, and the whole crowd was still singing it. While it wasn't necessarily every single person in the crowd knowing all the lyrics, the the ones that were singing were certainly loud enough to fill out the at least the microphones at home. They fought on the floor at the beginning here. Ortiz was down there at ringside too. They brawled through the crowd. They mentioned this is Santana's first singles match in four hundred and fifty seven days. Santana's going after the eye. Uh, they make it into the ring, and Santana gets driven into the turnbuckle, so his eye is getting hurt. Uh, there was a crowd sign that read, it's a hard mox life. Yeah, pretty good. Um, so so Excalibur mentioned that they're selling John Moxley eye patches. On oh, Pro my Wrestling God. Keys. That's awesome. And they are. They're $15. <laughs> um, it's crazy. Oh, my God. So, you you got to love them. Like these at, at their core, this company, they, they are fueled by capitalists. Oh, of course. I mean, and... You know why wouldn't they be like uh, people want them? People would buy them. It's this. It's the sorry. I'm just. Bandana. I'm just. I'm just picturing people coming to the next AEW pay per view where they've got their eye patch on, their bandana around their neck, and they're carrying like a their AEW scarf. replica title. Like man, it's just oh, like what a fashion goodness. statement to be like oh, the AEW merchandise connoisseur. 
It, that's that's I mean that's what you can argue like the Bucks success. This whole movement is kind of built off of merchandise and, and pro wrestling tees. So, uh, update on Mox's eye patch. He's got the older eye patch, like the the thong eye patch on this week. Well, he's got multiples to sell now, so you're going to drop thirty dollars on both versions. No, yes, right. Ortiz was on the floor and he spit alcohol into the face of John Moxley. I didn't know how the announcers knew this was alcohol, but um, it was. And Santana hit him with a cannonball, frog splash, Moxley kicks out, and then Moxley takes a thumb to the bad eye of Santana. Both men are blinded. They morphed into Rick Martell and Jake Roberts here. And John Moxley finds him, kicks him in the gut, paradigm shift, and wins the match. Ortiz just jumps in and attacks. The inner circle comes in. And, well, f- first of all, before we talk about the post-match attack, uh, what did you think about the match? I think the match was okay. You know, I think I, because the promos were so good, maybe my expectations were heightened a little bit. And also, admittedly, I still had Mox versus Suzuki pretty fresh on my mind. And that match was just on a different level that, you know, would be very hard for any any match uh, uh, to, to, to kind of like be compared to. No, uh, I, I, I thought, thought this was, was very average. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a perfectly fine TV match. But like, mm, uh, didn't necessarily like live up to I think like the 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 heat of like the great promos that that set set it up, and maybe we can you know see say that was a result of the promos being too good almost for a match that ultimately was just you know uh, a bridge to the next week. It was just this was just one of X amount of like you know inner circle members that Moxley has to get through before getting to Jericho. So maybe it was maybe they just like over. They did too well, basically, with with, with Saint, uh, Santana's promo specifically. So, the, but the match itself, I thought, was okay. Not the best match on the show. Um, Jericho takes his title and he whips Moxley's back, which after last week, it, it just felt so out of place to do this. Like, um, you know, nowhere near, anywhere near the intensity of of last week. Um, Ortiz had a loaded sock. Hager did the running low knee. Guevara hit a 630. Um, that was kind of hard to see from the angle. And then the final shot was the Judas effect as they all pose over top of Hager. Uh, Jericho steps, steps on top of him as Ortiz counts three. And then the music plays and Jeff Cobb comes out. And he looks like he has uh, morphed into like... 1997 Taz as he walks out here the, the the hair is all wet and he comes in tour of the islands and they all pose over John Moxley to end the show in a pretty dominant fashion so um yeah in addition to those matches we announced for Atlanta we've also got John Moxley and Jeff Cobb next week this guy looked like he just came out of the shower man uh, <laughs> yeah. but but it was a look that worked for him you know like I mean I feel like I'm used to seeing Jeff Cobb like I don't know, just kind of like, you know, big friendly giant from the island. But here he was like dark and brooding. And I thought it, it was it, it, it was he was great. he was Matanza. He was the Matanza yeah. version of Jeff Cobb here. Minus exactly. the mask. Yeah, that's what yes. he kind of channeled here. Which, Which I was is a great- I, I love that version of Jeff. Cobb. Like he was awesome as Matanza. I think as you know, uh, coming out here as part of the a heel stable as sort of like the, the heavy silent heavy. Um, I, I thought this was a great look for for Cobb great treatment for him getting like got that final visual coming out as sort of like you know like like um like exactly like matanza is exactly like that that type of thing somebody hired him to just like kill and he came out and did that great reaction from this audience he made it made him immediately look like a main venter what what do you do next week in that match like be- yeah. You can always do you can always do the like Jericho just attacks Moxley and you do your your fuck finish. Um, do, do you see a finish in that match? Uh, I certainly don't see Cobb losing. Um, I don't think I, Moxley should lose either. So no, I, I don't think so be. either. It's they've kept him so protected that I wouldn't be even to establish Mox uh, to to establish Cobb. I uh, I just wouldn't do that right now. It's one of those weeks where like if they did a screwy finish, like I'd be happy. You know, I'd be happier with that than to see either guy lose at this point right now. I love this show. I thought this was one of the better Dynamite episodes they've done. I just thought there was so much great stuff on this show. Some excellent promos. I really got into the the women's match a lot. The tag match was was very, very strong. Um, I have very uh, the Britt Baker promo. I I really love that that segment. I, I thought this was a really, really strong episode tonight. 
It was a very good show. Featured a, a really nice surprise in Jeff Cobb. I think strong promos, strong matches, uh, moved really well. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the show. Like, you can find, uh, you know, nothing was at the level of, like, the, the Cody strapping segment, for instance, from last week. But from start to finish, um, this was as consistent a show, I think, as Dynamite's put out. Like, there was, um, ah, I, I just thought everything moved on this show. And, um, yeah, I, I really, really liked uh, this week's episode. So, I mean, I, th- I think, I mean, over the, 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 definitely at the beginning of this year, like, they've really found their groove, you know, like maybe the first few months were them kind of figuring out um, the whole TV thing, figuring out like the right amount of breast in ring action versus the right amount of backstage backstage segment, getting characters established. It feels like a lot of these things are finally falling into place. And I think the results of it were, you know, excellent segments like the one you got last week. And I think just overall, like great improvements and great building of like brand new talent. And I include hangman page among those. Uh, a lot of success stories right now in the in the in the in the roster. Yeah, they just feel like they've got um a lot of momentum behind them at the moment. Like just uh, they're building up the shows well. The shows are coming off very well, and it just seems like they have they have a lot of the buzz right now. Um, it just feels like they're they're very much clicking going into this pay per view. So now we are going to click onto forum.postwrestling.com and. Is this where everyone gives it like a five or something after we've just uh, gushed about this show? On a scale of one to ten, you guys said this show was an 8.38. That's a high number. That's pretty high for our forum. Okay, Paul from New Jersey writes, Only one thing I have to talk about tonight. If WWE ever watches anything from AEW, make it the Santana promo. As somebody who is slowly going blind, I found this to be tremendous, powerful, a terrific blend of kayfabe and real-life hardship. This promo could give a jaded wrestling fan chills. Certainly did for me. Compare the way this character's promos have been constructed to the Lacey Evans character. You don't need dog food or a cuck angle. Some of the best stories are the real ones that hit close to home. 10 out of 10 show, Dark Order stuff is still cringe. Yeah, that to me... um, bringing about that real life story about his father and how it so turns into like why Santana had such a reaction last week to this guy going after his eye. I was like, my God, this is like unbelievable. um, Just depth to this story that was just brought about through two weeks of promos from Santana to build up this TV main event. I wonder how that would have even come up, you know, like, because the Moxley blinding thing probably came about just because they, they thought it was a cool angle. And then was it Santana, like, wanting to relate it to his real life? Possible, yeah. That that resulted in this? I mean, yeah, I find the whole, maybe the making of that whole thing really interesting. Um, okay, we got Adam from Scarborough who says, I don't write in too often, but man, what a fantastic episode from top to bottom. I know a lot of people are probably asking about Cobb and if he's full-time or not, but what do you think of the idea of AEW bringing someone in for a short period, doing a few big matches with them, and then moving on, almost like a special attraction? Yeah, I, I don't um, I don't hate the idea in principle. I would say, though, for AEW at the moment... I would be steering away from that unless you had a really compelling reason to do so only because there, there is a waiting line of so many performers that you do have under contract that I would have precedence over a special attraction coming in for three weeks. But I, I I don't oppose that idea. Like if someone, and again, at the time of this, like I don't know exactly what the status is of Jeff Cobb signing. Uh, You would certainly think like given how much uh, attention they gave to him tonight, you would think he's, uh, coming in, but we will uh, look to confirm that. But I'm not, uh, I'm not against that idea, just that you know, one of our frequent complaints is that there's so many performers on this roster that they just don't have time to get to that uh, I'm sure could rub people the wrong way to see someone just come in, leapfrog everybody, and, and be focused upon for a month. I personally feel, feel like that would only be justifiable if like the person was a really big star. That would be like, you know, almost like a guaranteed ratings mover. Like if Brock Lesnar was available and right. AEW wanted to bring him in for like, you know, a month and then send him off. Or like, I don't know, somebody like, somebody who was just exceptional. You know, like a Kazuchika Okada was only available for a month. Bring him in and send him back to New Japan. Sure. Um, I don't necessarily see that for uh, most talent. 
Um, and like John said, so many other people waiting to get those spots. And if somebody's just not a big deal, or at least not a big enough deal to like justify stopping everything to give the, that main event showcase to that person, I I don't see it. You know, um, I don't see them. La- I don't see labeling them at least as special attractions. I mean, they've done sort of like trial runs, I think, with undercard talent, like maybe people on dark and things like that. But if we're talking a main event spot for a short period of time, that person better be pretty deserving of it. Uh, that was you. Okay. Um, so we go next to, uh, the wolf. This show was a must see show. I can't really say you should skip anything. It made me want to buy the pay-per-view and I probably will now. Jericho is easily the hottest thing right now for me in all of wrestling. So glad to see Cobb in AEW. I'm a big fan. I think he had something very unique to the show. A solid nine, maybe even a 10. I'm really curious, like for, for most people, like what match they're looking forward to the most on this show? Because I, I think for many, it would be uh, Jericho Moxley, but I could see just as many people voting for Cody MJF as the hottest program, you know? Oh yeah, so, it's it's one A one B. Like they've both been built up tremendously well. And then for some people, it might be Paige and Omega versus potentially the Bucks if that's one of the matches on that show. I like those three matches. Plus, trying to like, what else are they doing? Probably Nyla Rose and somebody else, and Dustin we, and we have, uh, Dustin and Hager. We have we have Darby yeah. Allen and Sammy Guevara. That'll um, be good too. Like, yeah, that's a solid, really solid lineup. Um. So, yeah, we, we shall see. Raymond from Sacramento says, That was an example of dynamite firing on all cylinders, like a well-oiled machine. I'm a big fan of the company, but tonight, the February 12th, 2020 episode is something that, that they've been building to on a weekly basis. A mixture of promos hitting their mark, feuds and angles being expanded upon or solidified leading into a pay-per-view. Great matches. Whoa, MJF. Congratulations, Nyla Rose, on the title win and the Jeff Cobb surprise. A killer episode. My favorite they've done so far. No ifs, ands, or buts. A complete 10 out of 10 episode. Wow, look at this. High praise for the show. Uh, Billy writes, first time writing in. This was the best episode of a weekly wrestling show I can remember. Perfect balance of matches and segments. Great build for future shows and the pay-per-view. Best women's match in AEW so far. Would you go so far as to say that way? Like, this one... This got really over with the crowd. Well, what would what would you have said b- before that? You know what I might say if the, if this qualifies, um, I would say the most buzz was maybe that uh, intergender match from a few weeks ago on the cruise. Now, I know that's not a strict women's match, um, but if we're looking at just yeah. women's match, like I, the fact is, on TV, on TV or even pay per view. Like to be honest, there isn't a women's match that comes to mind for me that like. Am I overthinking or like not no, thinking not. of well, one? I, I, I would have said before this, I think at least the most memorable, notable match that AEW's done was probably Nyla Rose versus uh, uh, Riho from, from the, first the first week episode. Yeah. And this was a better this match. This was way than better. That. So, yeah. Way better than it. So, I don't, I don't think it's um, too outrageous to say that at all. We go to Noah from Vaughn who says, Hey guys, hope you're both feeling great tonight because after that show I just watched, I know I am. Awesome show this evening with tons of great matches. The tag team opener was great, and it made sense that SCU would be more aggressive coming off of their defeat from a few weeks back. Riho vs. Nyla was the match of the show for me, and one of my favorite women's matches of the year so far. Tremendous action, and the crowd was electric for that match. Even MJF vs. Jungle Boy was really good. They were both tremendous in that match. I'm super excited to see Cobb in AEW. However, with his match versus Moxley next week, I'm kind of curious as to how they get out of that corner where neither can really afford a loss at this point. But nonetheless, I'm intrigued by next week's show, which was which is shaping up to be an insanely loaded show. I really enjoyed this week's episode. Getting give it a nine out of ten. Well, let's let's think about that. Like, I do feel like if Moxley loses, I don't think that's the worst thing. You know, it 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 if Moxley loses. Uh, after he comes really close to beating Cobb, but because Jericho comes in at the very end and basically, you know, costs him another victory, I I don't think that's the worst thing as a way to not only establish Cobb but also to generate heat, further heat for that match. If if Cobb's if if Cobb's in, there's certainly an argument that there's no better way to bring this guy in than beating the guy who we have protected as much as anyone in this company, um, and. 
you could also do something like dastardly at the end that brings Moxley back the following week on the go home show to cut the promo of all promos on what he's going to do to Chris Jericho on, on Sunday. And if he is winning the title from Jericho, which I don't throw that out, um, mm-hmm. there be, there's an even a better argument to Cobb beating him right before Moxley wins the title. Like you have done enough with Moxley that if that's the direction you're going, I'd actually advocate for that with Cobb right now. And you immediately establish a natural first challenger for him. Um, And, you know, Noah brings up this point about kind of they're in this corner of which way you go. And I think that can be a real good thing when you get to a point where you don't know how this match is going to end and that's why doing like a screwy finish, once you introduce that as your way out of these situations, it takes the edge away. And that to me is something that if you at least do a finish here, it tells you that when we are in a corner and people can't determine an outcome, but we know we're getting a winner and a loser in the long run, I think that enhances your product. Okay. What about the possibility of a time limit draw? It could be the time to do that as well. That's that's another way you could do this, and that's less of a unsatisfying finish for the audience. I think there would still be some disappointment, but not like Jericho running in and attacking Moxley. I kind of feel like anything but a win would make Cobb look kind of weak and ineffective as hired help. You know, right. he would feel like Butcher and the Blade. Well, tonight you did this big beatdown on Moxley. So you have the story of he's going in uh, blinded and beaten down seven days after this attack um, that mm-hmm. Cobb can get this win. And and I would say, like, if next week we're talking about uh, Cobb winning this match, I think it it adds to people's belief, I think, that you're seeing a title change at the pay-per-view. Like, in a, in a way, that kind of enhances your main event because I think people would naturally be looking at that as the logical direction. It's, it's really interesting. The fact that I don't know who's going to win. So, yeah. Um, your turn. Okay. We go to Tim who says, I was so tired after work. I almost skipped dynamite, but I'm glad I didn't. The answer to who is AEW's next star is answered. Jeff Cobb is everything AEW needs. He's a monster and a freak athlete. He has badass presence in spades. Whatever they do with him, I hope they treat him like a star. Okay, Ryan writes, this, That was the best show I've watched in a long time. Everything was nearly perfect, except I wasn't a fan of the post-match beatdown of Moxley, but it did set up Jeff Cobb, so I guess it's all right in the end. Even the women's segments were great. Britt Baker seems to be hitting her stride, and Nyla Rose seems like a dominant monster champion. Finally, we got to be Detroit who says, well, I was going to chime in about tonight's show, but I've seen all the positive feedback and I don't want to ruin the party. Six out of 10 for me. Show was just fine. Oh, uh, what a cop out. You you got to explain yourself then after you've I seen. I especially wanted to hear from some somebody who perhaps, you know, found who didn't agree with, with somebody else. And, and please don't be afraid because if you are able to, you know, uh, if you watch the show, you have a clear idea of like, you know, why you didn't like it doesn't mean like you're wrong it means you're you're just as right as any anybody i think if you watch provided that you paid as much attention like if you're somebody who maybe just flipped the channel on and then dismissed it then okay but it sounds to me like you might have had an actual opinion and i'd love to hear it in the next time if even if you disagree we welcome opposing points of view Mm -hmm. but that's like watching parasite and being like ah wasn't for me like yeah, you got You got to give some some context yeah. to such a loaded re- uh, reaction. Yeah, yeah. Just explain. It's certainly like I don't think anybody should li- love every everything. That's that's kind of crazy. Well, this was a this was an outstanding episode of AEW Dynamite, and that's going to wrap things up, everybody. But we're going to be chatting about this show. Uh, we'll also talk about NXT uh, coming up Thursday, three p.m. Eastern time, live for all patrons. It is the Cafe Hangout. Marcus Vanderberg from Yahoo is going to be joining us. He was in attendance at the WrestleMania press conference on Tuesday at SoFi Stadium. So we're going to hear from him about uh, the stadium that is in the middle of construction uh, before it opens this summer. So he's going to share with us what uh, how the stadium looks uh, so far. This thing. This looks incredible, this stadium. Like, I'm uh, I'm really intrigued to, like, go to this stadium next year. Me too. Me too. Yeah, to me, that's always part of the draw is to see these, like, incredibly built, massive, modern structures. Um, and do you think they'll... 
I mean, uh, what I'm most curious about is like how many seats will open it up to. Because what was what is the current record in, for Dallas? Was well, ninety something. The record that that they tout is WWE like one hundred and one thousand. It's really closer to. I, I I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's it's somewhere in like the like eighty range. I think is. Oh, okay. Well, I, I guess what I mean is, do you think it's it's a big enough stadium that they'll at least um, be th- that they could possibly um, justify calling it a brand new record? They will. <laughs> I have no, I have no <laughs> no doubt that they will somehow reach that number. Way I, I do. Um, Got it. Anyway, so we'll chat about that with Marcus. Uh, Friday, we've got two shows coming your way. A new uh, post pro res with myself, WH Park, and Dylan Fox is going to jump on with us from the Eastern Lariat podcast. We're going to chat about uh, all Japan's big card that they had earlier this week uh, with Kento Miyahara defending the Triple Crown against Yuma Aoyagi. And then Friday night, it's the Valentine's Day edition of Rewind to SmackDown with myself and Mr. Wei Ting. Saturday, Nate Milton is going to be chatting about uh, Fast Five. Uh, with the crew from the Too Fast, Too Forever podcast. Uh, they will be the guests with Nate Milton. And then Sunday, we've got Thunderstruck with WH Park. And Sunday night, Brayden and Davey Portman are back with a post show following the NXT TakeOver card, uh, which we can also preview on the Hangout on Thursday. So look forward to that. We hope we uh, hear from some of you taking your calls on Thursday. Uh, that is it for us. Good night. <laughs>